Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. It was the summer of 2015, and a few of my gal pals and I went on a camping trip to Yellowstone National Park. Every year, we went somewhere to just enjoy and renew our friendship. This trip seemed a little out of character, a little more outdoorsy than normal, but I was up for it. We set up our camp in a rather secluded area. It was surrounded by huge trees and a dry lake over to the other side of us. In the distance, I could see a few RVs, but we were the only open tent campers in that area. Our first night in Yellowstone was wonderful. It was uneventful. There were soothing sounds of nature that lulled us to sleep. I began to think that maybe I could do this camping thing and that it was not so hard. However, around 3 a.m., I was rudely awakened by a peculiar and unsettling noise. It was a series of bizarre sounds, like someone standing outside of my tent and screaming out, whoop, whoop, whoop. I peeked out of the opening of my tent. I could see my friend's tent close by, but there was nothing else around us. Whatever was making the sound had to have been in the woods. As my senses sharpened, I realized that the strange calls were being answered in the distance, as if some unseen creatures were communicating through the night. The air was still. There was a very foul odor hanging around our tents. It smelled like someone with incredibly bad body odor had been in our camp, except it was much worse. I was still looking out the opening of my tent. It was beautiful outside with a partial moon. My eyes adjusted, and I was able to see better in the darkness. While I was looking out of the tent, I heard what sounded like a large tree branch crashing to the ground. It broke the silence with a deafening crack. I was waiting for my friends to come flying out of their tents, but apparently they slept through it. I went back inside and crawled into my sleeping bag. I was able to fall back asleep directly. My mind was still racing with explanations of what that sound might have been. The night got quiet again, and I was almost asleep. Just as I was drifting out of consciousness, there was another loud bang that echoed through the night. It was loud and close, and my heart began to beat incredibly fast. The noise was so loud, it sounded like it was in our camp. My friends had still not emerged from their tents. I was beginning to think they could sleep through anything. But instantly... I heard a deep, bone-chilling roar that echoed through the night and valley. 
It was extremely loud and intense. It was probably 200 yards away from us, but it was deep in the woods. I instantly thought that it was a bear or some other wildlife. I could tell by the intensity of the volume this creature was large. As if that were not enough, I suddenly heard two high-pitched screams. That was enough to wake my friends, and they came bolting out of their tents in a panic. Jane, one of my friends, whispered that she could smell something putrid like rotting trash. I couldn't help but wonder if some bear had ravaged a nearby trash pile, but the smell was fleeting and faded into the night after a few moments. Now the three of us were awake, we had a moment to chat. We decided to all move into one tent for safety. I had the largest tent of three, so we all huddled our sleeping bags together and tried to go back to sleep. I listened to the unsettling noises in the distance. Fear finally had gripped us, and we were unable to fall back asleep. It wasn't long before dawn, so we opted to get up and make a fantastic breakfast to make up for the lack of sleep. When we emerged from the tent, I was expecting to find the campground in disarray, evidence of some nocturnal visitor's rampage. Much to my surprise, everything appeared exactly as it had been the day before. There were no signs of trash thrown all around. There was no disturbances in the surroundings. It was as though the unsettling events of the night left no physical trace on this earth. We decided to make the best of our day, and we continued to explore the park. We hiked throughout the day, on and off. On our way back to camp, we stopped at the campground's door. As I was checking out, I couldn't help but resist mentioning the strange things that had been happening the night before to the clerk who was on duty. I asked if she had ever heard of people reporting such things. She gently smiled as she begged her items. She did reveal that there had been several reports, sightings, and strange occurrences that have been happening. The employees were given instructions not to talk about it to tourists, but since we were a group of three women alone, she felt we should know. She revealed that over several months, there had been many reports and occurrences that were related to Sasquatch. With more and more tourists visiting the park, the sightings had apparently been on the rise. She said most park officials do not acknowledge them because they do not want to scare away the tourists. She slipped something into our bag at the end of our transaction. I saw her do it, but I did not know what it was. When I got the bag and started to leave, I looked inside. There was a can of bear repellent. I looked at her and smiled and mouthed the words, thank you. She smiled and nodded. Even though I understood what she was saying, I was still in disbelief. I was trying to wrap my head around the possibility that what we heard might have been a Sasquatch. I had mixed emotions about it. I was both thrilled and excited, yet I was also frightened and terrified. My friends were outside in oversized wooden chairs waiting for me. I caught up with them, but I chose not to tell them about the possible Sasquatch activity in the area. While we were not overly girly girls, we were still not the rough and rugged outdoors people like so many people here. I thought that information was best kept on a need-to-know basis, and they did not need to know. That night was surprisingly peaceful. There were no sounds like the night before that had haunted us. The woods were still, except for the normal sounds of the nocturnal life that lived in the woods. I could hear small animals walking around, birds singing, and the occasional sound of a bat taking flight overhead. We were able to get some rest, but we all stayed in one tent again. For the rest of the night, we did not hear anything. We were able to enjoy our last night at Yellowstone. It was extremely peaceful and a fantastic way to end our trip.
The next day, we packed up our supplies, went on one last short hike, and then left. I always wondered if we had encountered Sasquatch that first night. On to the next one. Near Nashville in Davidson County in Tennessee. I was born, raised, and currently live near Nashville, Tennessee. When I was about 13 years old, I had a four-wheeler. My dad used to take me to a piece of property owned by one of his customers, which is located in western Davidson County, about 10 miles directly west of downtown Nashville. There, I could ride my ATV and shoot guns. One afternoon, a couple of hours before dark, I was riding my ATV on an old logging road which ran along a creek in the bottom of a holler, a valley between two ridges. My nine-year-old stepbrother was on the back of the ATV hanging on for dear life as I sped down the logging road at over 40 miles per hour. He tucked his head between my shoulder blades as he sat behind me because he was apparently scared of my driving. The power company had brush hogged or cut the brush in 150 foot wide path centered on the power line as per routine maintenance. The power line right of way had grown up really thick since the last cutting, which must have been two years prior to this. Just before the old logging road passed under the power line, there was a dog leg in the road. The road went straight, made a 20 degree turn to the right and immediately turned another 20 degrees back to the left now running in the same direction as it was originally, just three to four feet to the right of the original vector. I had fun seeing how fast I could drive through the dog leg and also scaring my younger stepbrother. On this particular day, I got up to speed, fishtailed through the dog leg and proceeded to drive past the thick overgrowth, approximately eight to 10 feet high, which ran under the power line. At this point, I saw something that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. From the brush on the left side of the road, something ran out in front of me. It was covered in five to eight inch long dark brown hair, about seven and a half to eight and a half feet tall and was running on two legs. It passed right in front of me with lightning speed. I'd say it took only about two steps to clear the 12 foot wide logging road. It then disappeared into the overgrowth on the right side of the logging road. I didn't really get a clear look at the creature because it happened so fast. I didn't stop either. Out of fear, I applied full throttle to the ATV in an attempt to vacate the area. My stepbrother didn't see the thing because he was hiding in fear of my reckless driving. I yelled out to him to see if he'd seen the creature, but he thought I was joking. The best description I can give of the way I felt after the incident would be to compare it to having a near miss in a fatal automobile crash. My heart just felt like it stopped before it began to beat out of my chest. Nearly an hour passed before I found the courage to return to the location of the sighting. I had to go back through the location because it was the only way back to my dad's truck. The first time I drove back through, I was traveling at a high rate of speed due to fear. Curiosity eventually got the best of me, and I returned, still on my ATV, just as it was getting dark. I found no tracks. It was extremely dry at the time, smelled nothing out of the ordinary, and saw only a path through the brush which appeared to be seldom used. I didn't say a word to my dad about what I'd seen when he asked why I'd been gone for so long. If I had, he would have thought I was out of my mind. I didn't tell anyone for a very long time. To this day, the event plays over in my mind like a movie. It was approximately two hours before dark, sunny, hot, and dry, mainly hardwood forest, hills, hollers, and creeks. Not far from my subdivision, but also in the midst of thousands of acres of timber. 
on to the next one. A young man, 16 years of age, was driving home from his girlfriend's house near Palmyra in Montgomery County just before midnight. Going down a hill, he saw what he thought was a deer on the side of the road. It was brown, really hairy, and was on all fours. He thought it was a pretty big deer. He slowed down, thinking he was going to get a good look at the deer, and was only 100 yards from it when it stood up on two feet and ran into the woods. It scared the daylight out of him. There was a real foul smell at the time as well. On to the next one. When not blaming hoaxes, skeptics argue that abruptly ending Sasquatch trackways are merely misidentification of a common wildlife narrative. A rodent bounding along leaves vaguely footprint-shaped tracks before being scooped up by a bird of prey, leaving the impression of a vanishing trail. This is a believable explanation for vague print found in snow, but does little to explain the sudden termination of clearly defined tracks in other media. This isn't to suggest flesh and blood hypothesis advocates provide better explanations. A variety of scenarios, each less likely than the last, are deployed by anyone hoping to dismiss how trackways suddenly vanish. By far the most reasonable is that Bigfoot used their immense stride, occasionally reported as large as 10 feet or greater, to step onto media that does not transfer footprint, examples being rocks, trees, roots, streams, and the like. This is a possible explanation in some cases, but what of tracks ending in the middle of a field surrounded by identical unsullied media? Others suggest Bigfoot take to trees when wishing to avoid detection. Though arboreal forest sounds odd, some have observed large hairy hominids moving through the canopy. Once more, we are faced with an answer quite possible in certain circumstances, like old growth forests capable of supporting a 400 to 600 pound primate, but less likely when trees are thin branches appear weak or extremely high, or there are simply no trees nearby. A counter-argument focused on Bigfoot's ability to leap unnaturally far. Some argue Bigfoot tiptoe backwards through their tracks, presumably to confuse investigators. Researcher Jeffrey Teagle entertained Bigfoot's flesh and blood existence until he encountered the valley trackway. Backtracking provided unfruitful, as I realized that the creature did not reverse its path because the other prints left behind remained too defined and undistorted, he wrote. So the creature did not backtrack to cover its whereabouts. In another instant, Teagle found a set of tracks ending in a gully of saplings, indicating the Sasquatch did not jump into a tree. Another idea is that Bigfoot deliberately brush away their tracks. One of the clearest descriptions of this came from controversial Bigfoot habituator Janice Carter Coy, who said, They do drag branches to cover their tracks. They dust the tracks out with them. You ask me about the big guys covering their tracks with tree branches. Anyway, they had some cedar branches and drug them behind them from the woods and field all the way into the barn. Once before this, they did the same thing when they crossed the dirt road that we had at the time in front of our house. It was a long time ago, and I don't remember what they were after on the other side of the road. One morning, they just came to the edge of the woods, broke off those pines or some other type of tree limb and cross the fence on our side and the fence on the other side. One Bigfoot used a tree limb off an old poplar tree to cover her tracks late one afternoon, around maybe one or two when it was hot and in the summertime. She used it to sweep after herself while walking backward. 
she walked backwards all the way to where she swept at under the two trees that were over the rocks that we called her cave, even though it isn't really a cave. I don't know why she did this, but it did make the grass stand back up where she had just stepped on it. By the way, when she walked backward, she didn't take long strides to do this. Her steps were a lot closer together, and she went really slow. I don't think they are adept enough to walk backward and watch where they are going at the same time. I don't remember her looking behind herself to see where she was going at all. She just sort of stepped on everything and anything and bumped into the trees and all. That was why I thought it was so funny at the time. It looked funny the way she was doing it. Koi also claimed to have seen Bigfoot walking backwards in their tracks without brushing their footprints away. They do this, and I don't know the reason, except they are trying to cover their tracks as to where they have been, or that they are trying to cover their tracks up for the real direction they are going in, she said, speculating it might be sort of like a fox backtracking on its own trail to cover its scent. Some researchers argue animal populations in high-risk areas alter their behavior to avoid detection. After re-established populations in Colorado and Idaho, both bears and wolves began moving exclusively at night, decreased their territory, and avoided leaving tracks that reveal their whereabouts and travel routes, according to Tom Powell. If bears are clever enough to conceal their whereabouts, by taking care not to leave obvious tracks, the same ought to be true for smarter creatures such as Bigfoot. If not to frustrate researchers, what other reason might Bigfoot walk backward or otherwise obscure their tracks? A variety of indigenous cultures place emphasis on walking backward as a means of spiritual protection. Dine Navajo tradition dictates that after burying the dead, they walk backward and brush out their tracks so that no evil spirit can follow. In the Indian subcontinent, any cursed object can be disposed of at a crossroad, provided it is approached and left by walking backwards to confuse any attached spirit. When harvesting ochre, Aboriginal Australians thwarted the Mondong fairy-type creatures by leaving mines backwards, brushing away their footprints as they went. Plenty of creatures in folklore walk backward, reflecting their inversion of the natural order. This extends to large hairy hominids. The Migoy, a Yeti variant, is said to become invisible and to walk backward to fool any trackers. Researcher Dmitry Baranov writes of the Russian Almasti having spotted people, they would stand still, sometimes for a long time, and would never immediately run on a surprise encounter, but would first step quietly backward. Further complicating matters, both fairies and a variety of Bigfoot analogs, including the Chinese Fei Fei, display rear-facing feet. Perhaps the most popular explanation for disappearing trails cites Bigfoot's ability to make superhuman leap. According to some, Bigfoot jump either to a distant tree rock, or other hard media to avoid leaving footprints. This scenario is also employed to explain large gaps in trackways. In 1875, newspaper articles described a wild man seen near the Warda Gap in Burke County, Pennsylvania. The creature stood more than seven feet tall, was covered in hair, and leapt ten feet at a time with apparent ease. In 1941, Numerous witnesses spotted a baboon-like creature near Mount Vernon, Illinois. It was noted for its ability to move 20 to 40 feet per leap. A witness on Ben McDwee, home to Scotland's Big Grey Man, found a series of 19-inch footprints in the snow on December 2, 1952. At one point, the track jumped over a distance of 30 feet. In 1964, Mr. and Mrs. Ahmed Bey were driving near a railroad track near Kolishuar, Turkey, when a UFO the size of a house 
descended, disgorging an enormous hairy creature. The beast ran towards their car in fantastic leaps, prompting Mr. Bay to grab his knife and confront the creature. When he tried to stab the beast, it lifted him bodily, dropped him, then stepped upon him. Miss Bay ran to fetch the police, who allegedly found her husband's corpse at the site. Lee Burnett, uncle to Bigfoot researcher Tom Burnett, allegedly ran into a 500-pound ape-man in the North Carolina mountains that could leap 20 to 30 feet in a single bound. In April 1973, Mr. and Mrs. Henry McDaniel of Enfield, Illinois, saw a short ape man with stubby arms and pink eyes cover 50 feet in three steps. During the infamous Noxy Indianola Bigfoot Flap of 1975, a large, hairy hominid moved across the Oklahoma landscape via startlingly long hops, rather like a kangaroo. According to a 1992 article picked up by the Daily Telegraph, two red-eyed abominable snowmen were sighted on a Russian military outpost. The largest was 10 feet tall, and both leapt over a nine-foot fence to escape pursuers. Otto Bernamonti was clearing brush near Scaglia e Pasalupo, Italy, in May 1997, when he spied a figure watching him from the trees. Returning later with his vehicle, he found, upon closer inspection, it was a large bipedal creature covered in reddish-brown hair. The creature covered the distance between them in one enormous leap and screamed at Bernamonti, who drove away as quickly as possible. Beginning in 2001, a monkey man started harassing settlements throughout India. It was variously reported as a monkey, a man with a monkey face, a man with a mask and a helmet, or even an alien or robot, and could jump 20 feet into the air from a crouched position. It went across the road. It would probably take me 13 to 15 steps to cross this road. This thing did it in one leap. Podcaster Wes Germer said of his sighting, One of the creatures appeared to leap onto the road, bounced off it as if it were a trampoline, and disappeared into the trees with an otherworldly gliding motion. The incident of three toed footprints takes on new meaning in the light of bounding Bigfoot, as there exists a mammalian correlation between three toed feet and enormous leaps. The kangaroo, whose family name, Macropodidate, literally means big foot, having three primary toes, a similar configuration present in certain hopping desert rodents. Indeed, people have even mistaken Bigfoot for kangaroos because of this locomotion. In 1907, Pennsylvania Reading Times wrote of a strange wild animal which was supposed to be a kangaroo is a baboon. Several years earlier, an Oregon paper published a similar piece on a hairy kangaroo man spotted by miners with a few bounds was out of our sight. If Bigfoot exists, there is ample evidence for their ability to cross great distances through incredible jumps. But how far can they jump? 30 feet? 50 feet? 80? 100? In his excellent work, Mysterious Creatures, A Guide to Cryptozoology, George M. Abenhart writes North American apes, aka apes, can leap 20 to 40 feet in a single bound. This is pushing but not exceeding the recorded distance for the largest leaps in the animal kingdom. Depending on the source, the snow leopard or clip springer, a small African antelope, jump furthest circa 50 feet horizontally. Both max out at 20 to 25 foot vertical leap. Suffice to say, plenty of disappearing Bigfoot trails end in soft media far exceeding a 50 foot radius. While leaping Bigfoot might explain certain trackways, they fail to account for the most vexing circumstances. On to the next one. In Erie County in New York, 
myself and my girlfriend at the time were riding her father's four-wheeler through a forest near Leisurewood, which is a campground in western New York. In the past, younger children and adolescents, not excluding myself, have felt a menacing presence in the forests around Leisurewood, especially at night. But we've always dismissed it as just the creep or something of the sort. But after what I saw, I'm convinced that something odd lived there, or at least was passing through. While riding our four-wheeler near some abandoned railroad tracks, I saw a flash of black cut into the wood. I estimated its height at six foot five, but I had no time to guess, really. But I just dismissed it as a figment of my imagination. Approaching about 9.30 and getting dark, we headed home, which involved going through a forest off normal trail. As we were riding over the motor, I heard a high-pitched whistle and a rustling not far behind us. We had to ride slow because we weren't on real trails. And when I looked back, I had the impression that a large black bulk was chasing us. Then the truly terrifying part occurred. I looked upon two yellow glowing eyes. We hauled our way home with her seeing nothing and me not telling her to avoid scaring her. I still won't go back there. I'm not so sure that it was attacking us. It may have simply been running us off, scared, startled by our motor. I've never heard of anything like it in the area, except in Iroquois legend. If it were my guess, I'd say this creature was traveling from Tonawanda Indian Reservation to some place more remote. It was about half a mile off of some abandoned railroad tracks, which have now been converted into a bicycle path in a swampy forest. On to the next one. In Fulton County in New York, my best friend and I were driving around one night at about 2 a.m., we ended up on a little youth dead-end road. We were uh, out of the vehicle to relieve ourselves, hence the dead end with no houses on it. We were in the middle of nowhere, but why take chances getting spotted? We finished up our business, and I was back in the truck waiting for my buddy. I turned on the headlight, and illuminated in the beam was a very tall man-shaped animal, brown in color. It stood perfectly still for a minute, and then grunted at us. Then it turned and walked away. It didn't move like a man. It kind of swaggered back and forth like it lugged each leg forward when it walked. We were really freaked out, so we backed up all the way to the road. Afterward, we rationalized that it must have been a moose, but I don't think it was. For starters, I've seen moose before, and they're huge, this was tall enough. It looked well over six feet tall, but it stood on two legs and it didn't have antlers. But at the time, we had to rationalize what we saw. My father is an officer with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. He says that what we saw was a moose. It could not have been a Bigfoot, but I disagree. I went back and searched for moose tracks, none. Dropping? None. But rabbit. In fact, I found no tracks of any kind. But that doesn't mean anything, because the ground is all soft needles and leaves. I went back the next day and found no tracks or droppings to identify my creature was a moose or a bear, the only large animals in my area. We were driving around for about an hour before the sighting, if you will. Before that, we had a midnight meal at a diner at Fultonville. It was about 2 a.m. It was a very clear night. There were stars in the sky. It was chilly and very well lit. I had my high beams on. It is mostly maple and oak, some pine. The area has been logged many years ago, so most of the forest is under 75 years old. I'm sure there's a creek running somewhere through there, too. I've heard of sightings in Benson about an hour north of me, 
but I'm not sure I believe those stories. On to the next one. In Essex County in New York, I'm on the mailing list for Bigfoot Report, and recently I read one about there being a sighting in Ticonderoga. I've always been interested in Bigfoot and thought I would take a trip up there and see if I could find anything. I live in Pennsylvania, and this was the closest report to where I live. I parked at the entrance to a hiking trail and walked in on the trail for about one mile before leaving the trail and climbing up a hill for about 100 yards till I came to a flat area where I would camp. I had a backpack and a tree stand plus a tape recorder. I planned to spend the night in the tree stand up a tree and try to record any weird noises. After finding the flat spot, I left my gear there and went for a walk to look around. It was 4 p.m. I had only gone a short distance when I found some tracks that resembled a human foot. There was no definition because the ground was covered with leaves. Just the elongated impression going up the hill past my camp. I did find one print in some bare soil that showed a human-type foot with four definite toe print, but the middle toe did not show up. Assuming there should have been five toes, the two toes on each end of the foot were pushed out to the side, pointing away from where the middle toe should have been. The print was about 12 inches long and 7 inches wide at the ball of the foot behind the toes and 3 and a half inches at the heel. The toes did not taper toward the little toe as much as a human foot does. This gave it a triangular shape. I heard what sounded like somebody hitting a tree with a wooden baseball bat. Just one, but a good distance away. Returning to camp, I made supper and climbed a tree just as it was getting dark. I pulled up my backpack with the tape recorder inside. Things started to happen. There was another loud sound of wood striking wood just up the hill from where I was. It was repeated about five times within about a five-second pause between strikes. Then a tree fell over, but it did not make a cracking sound. It was as if it were pushed over. Not broken off, I had frozen and not recorded a sound because the recorder was still in the backpack. By the time I got it out, the sounds had stopped. Then I heard footsteps up the hill from me. Everything happened just out of sight, maybe 60 or 80 yards away. Needless to say, I was a little shaken. About three hours later, the hooting started. It did not sound like an owl. It sounded just like a person. Just a single hoot, a pause of three or four seconds, and then another single hoot. This went on for about two hours with other hoots coming from other locations on the surrounding hill, all too far away for me to record. There was an occasional wood striking wood sound in different locations the whole time. No theories of hit, just one time hit, maybe six or seven different spots around the area. All got quiet after that, real quiet, not a sound for the next three hours. I was freezing, so I got down out of the tree with my stuff and walked out at 3 a.m. by flashlight. I was so cold that I took my chances nothing would happen, and nothing did. I did not go back after daylight. I did not want to go alone in the first place, and hearing the banging on the trees so close to me really unnerved me big time. It sounded like they were swinging really hard. I doubt if a person could ever swing hard enough to make that sharp of a sound. It was between 4 p.m. and 3 a.m. It was on the southwest side of Eagle Lake, mixed hard and softwood, about three quarters of a mile from the lake. There are rolling hills, nothing very high. I met some people who were leaving after hiking around the trail across Route 74 as I arrived. I asked if they had seen anything on their hike that was unusual, and they said they had not. On to the next one. In Allahanny County in New York, 
This happened when my friend and I were 13, when I found out about Bigfoot. It was late winter and storming badly outside. We were outside playing in front of our house, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a huge shadow, and I remember saying, what the heck is that, to my friend, and before she could respond, we both saw the Bigfoot running on two feet on the side of the road from approximately 50 feet away. We thought at first it must be a very tall human, but when it went under the street light, we saw fur from head to toe, and it was approximately seven to nine feet tall. It was also running faster than I've ever seen anything else run. We both stood there in shock, unable to move or speak. I remember trying to scream, but nothing came out. After it ran out of sight, we both looked at each other and ran inside to tell her mother, who obviously didn't believe a word of what we were saying. We didn't go back outside afterward because we were terrified. To this day, we both remember it like it was last night, but no one believes their story. One unusual detail that was observed was that Bigfoot was running on the side of the road very fast, faster than I've ever seen anything run, and he was hairy from head to toe with dark colored hair. It happened at night, after dark, and it was snowing hard. We saw him running right on the side of a main road. He ran under a streetlight. On to the next one. Ron grew up in the northernmost house in Bern a small community in the southeast corner of Idaho by Bear Lake. When he was eight years old and spent a lot of time playing outdoors, on this particular day, he was out with a pellet gun shooting at ground squirrels. It was a warm, clear, sunny day in spring. Directly behind his house was a hill approximately 300 feet higher than the area surrounding the house. There wasn't much grass because it was early in the year. The rest of the area was covered with sagebrush and rock. It was a pretty remote area. I glanced up and distinctly saw a dark brown being much taller than a man. He had very long arms, he said. He walked up that hill faster than a grown man could run. He was very tall with a huge stride. Ron said he went inside and told his father what he had seen, and his father reassured him that other people had also seen the Bigfoot. He didn't get as excited over it as I thought he would. On to the next one. David Harper had a close encounter with a Bigfoot. It left him with an eerie feeling for several weeks. It happened during the summertime in the mid-70s, when he was a youngster of 12 or 13 years old. The home he grew up in had a circular kitchen with a bar in the middle, and the children were running around it in a big circle. I just happened to glance up and saw Bigfoot looking in the window at me, Harper said. The window was set up in the wall with the curtain on the bottom, so it had to be a pretty tall Bigfoot to even see into the room. He said it had a thinner face around the eyes than pictures he had seen depicting the Bigfoot. It also had cheeks that appeared fuzzy with black skin underneath the fur. I screamed out to my dad, Dad, there's a Bigfoot outside. Let's go out and see it. When we went outside, it was gone, Harper said. I can't imagine if we found footprints or not because it would have been standing in the flower bed. Harper said his father mentioned that other people had seen the Bigfoot in the area around the same time. He also remembers having an eerie feeling for nearly two weeks after that, almost like someone was watching him. Their home was the last house at the end of the road with a mountain range between them, so it would have been a simple feat to watch the family from nearby trees. He has continued to look for Bigfoot when outside anywhere, but hasn't seen anything remotely close. Over the years, I have told the story to a few people, but they think I am a liar, he said. 
I have never seen another one, even though I've kept my eyes open for the possibility. One thing is for sure, it was eerie. It was pretty spooky. I don't know that I want to see one that close again, he said. The biggest difference now is that I am not a believer. I am a knower. I know they are out there. On to the next one. Burn, Idaho is a little community not bigger than a bend in the road, and it is down the road from another small community called Ovid. Most people don't even notice the little town as they travel the road north of Bear Lake, unless they are hunting or camping. The children who grow up there tend to spend their time in the woods, usually making their own fun. Such was the case for Craig Kuntz and his cousin. They were camping in the canyon between Ovid and Preston, Idaho. Kuntz said they had been cutting firewood for the year. We were on the hill cutting firewood when our dog just went crazy, barking and growling. He was a little yapper of a dog, but we looked and we couldn't see anything, Kuntz said. It was just weird because he wasn't known to start barking without a good reason. The next night, he and his cousin went for a hike over the ridge from their base camp and away from safety. We both saw something big and dark in the brush, he said. It scared us, but we were more uneasy than anything else. It was like being extremely fearful of something unknown or unseen. I don't understand, but the hair stand up on your neck. Kunt shot his BB gun into the brush and they ran like crazy back to camp. They didn't tell anyone about it until years later. Many people thought they just made it up. It was a weird experience, he said, but I was only 11 and didn't have anything to compare it to. Normally, I wouldn't shoot a gun at something that I couldn't see, but the whole experience was kind of unnerving. We didn't know what was out there, it made us uptight and nervous. On to the next one. Brett Langston said that the first time he ran into a Bigfoot, he was only 12 years old. He was hunting, wearing an orange-colored vest, and could be easily seen. I was 12 years old and going hunting on my horse, he said. I got lost. I rode my horse down the hill to see where I was at. The horse started shimmying and shaking all over, and he felt that she was getting ready to throw him. I glanced up and could see a Bigfoot standing further down the hill watching me, he said. There was a lot of snow on the hill, but I really stood out and could be seen easily because of the hunter's orange I was wearing. He said the Bigfoot just watched him, and when he looked away, he was gone. Years later, Swainston saw Bigfoot once again. This time, he was south of Preston, flood irrigating a field, when a huge Bigfoot came stomping across the field through the water. It was getting dark then, so I didn't see him completely clearly, Swainston said. But he cleared a lot of ground very quickly and with good size. Swainston said that the Bigfoot wasn't bothering anyone. He was cutting across the valley from one mountain range to another, he said. As he was leaving the field, he cleared a 14-foot drainage ditch in one jump. In 2016, Swainston was up in Arban Valley, traveling towards Mink Creek. He said he was startled when a really big six-point buck came running across the road in front of his pickup. Right behind him ran a Bigfoot, he said. This one was gray and running fast. They were both traveling so quickly that it took a minute before I could realize what I was looking at. Swainston said once the Bigfoot realized he was there, it ducked down out of sight. The buck just stood there and panted as though it had been running for a long time. He was a big buck. I would have loved to have him on my wall. It wasn't the season, he said. The guys up there say you don't go out on horseback after dark because the horses are too scared to go anywhere. 
His last experience was in 2019 near Oxford. He came across a Bigfoot nest up on a hill. The Bigfoot had eaten half of a calf and left the bones up there, Plainston said. The mama cow was close by, and she was very agitated and upset. She had been there a while. He said the Bigfoot hair was all over the place. It was over four inches long. You could see where it had rolled around on the grass, and more had come off. Swainston said that seeing the Bigfoot hasn't really changed his life too much. It has made other people question him, though. Everyone tells me I'm a liar, he said, but I know that I don't lie. On to the next one. Del Reed Bergson wanted to get some fishing in one fall, so he took his 27-foot trailer, his wife, and two small dogs. Off they went. They had the trailer pulled over, separate from all the other fishermen by the head of the Blackfoot River near Poison Creek. Late one night, they were awakened by something rocking their trailer. It was the middle of the night at about one or two when the trailer started rocking, Bergson said, it woke me up out of a sound sleep. It felt like a big cow was rubbing against it. I thought I would go out and see what was happening. My wife said no. Something really stunk, and she didn't think it was a good idea at all. Their two black labs climbed under their bed with their tails between their legs. Not a good sign. So... Bergson finally decided to just lie down and wait it out. Then the trailer started rocking harder, so he got up to see what he could see. I got up and picked up my pistol, and by then the trailer was rocking good and hard, he said. I was going to open the door, but just as I reached the door, something grabbed the door handle and pulled on it. Thank heaven it was locked. At first, he thought it was a cattle rubbing on the trailer, but when the trailer was rocking so hard, he knew it wasn't cattle. Eventually, it quit, and he lay back down. The next morning, when I went to open the door, the door fell off its hinges. He said all of the screws on the door frame were stripped. He didn't know what to think of the experience. I got up the next morning and looked around outside, he said. There was no sign of cattle in the area, and the ground was so hard there were no tracks to be found either. I looked around and also asked the other campers if they had heard or saw anything. No one had. Bergson thought the reaction of his two labs was strange. If it had been a person, or even a cow, the dogs would have barked. But neither dog made a sound. They just climbed under the bed. Even now, years later, he is glad he didn't open the door. Everyone I spoke to near Blackfoot River said it sounded like a Bigfoot. I hadn't even thought of that at the time. On to the next one. While digging clams on Prince Island in British Columbia, Mr. Joe Hopkins saw a small Bigfoot walking up the beach and into the trees. On to the next one. Near Nelson in Kootenai County in British Columbia, in October, Mr. Bringsill saw a seven to nine foot tall hairy humanoid that left 16 to 17 inch long footprints. On to the next one. I had been out on my own for six months, living by competing at rodeos. I was just 16. I had just finished a rodeo in Washington and had a couple hundred in my pocket. Three fellow hands asked me to go with them on a canoe trip in British Columbia to get their winter meat. They were all BC natives. They were Jim, Kid, and Earl. Jim and Kid were sons of French trappers and native mothers. Earl was a full-blood native. They had lots of equipment and knew the area to the north and east of Risk Creek. 
we would launch the freighter canoes 20 feet long with seven and a half Evinrude kickers at a place near Horsley, east of Williams Lake, and go north and east from there up a string of lakes and rivers. We took two canoes with 35 gallons of spare gas, spare prop, and a hundred sheer pins. We had a tent in each canoe, a rifle and shotgun, two fishing rods, one tackle box, bedrolls, and a grub box. We traveled light because we knew there would be portages, and since they were all native, could shoot anything as we went. The word portage refers to the practice of carrying a canoe or other boat over land to avoid an obstacle on the water route, such as a rapid or a waterfall. We had 20 pounds of flour, salt, pepper, tea, lard, pemmican, and tobacco to give to natives we encountered. The word pemmican is a concentrated mixture of fat and protein used as a nutritious emergency foodstuff. The word comes from the Cree word pimican. Native people use it to get through hard times. It is a varying mixture made of dried meat, fruits, berries, and nuts, and is highly nutritious. Some of the oral history handed down by First Nations say that pemmican was traded back and forth between the warring Sasquatches and the peaceful natives years ago, often in trade for fresh meat and fish. My friends were from 20 to 23 years old. I was the baby. The first two days were uneventful. We made good time and moved steadily up a series of lakes and creeks. The first night we camped at an abandoned mine of some sort and dined on fresh fish and rice and beans. Day two, the streams got narrower and swifter and we had two portages. Still, we made nearly 50 miles. In our canoe, Jim and I, we had a Winchester, model 1130-06, and my 12-gauge, model 12 pump. Ducks and geese were everywhere, and we had those for dinner the second night, fixed with some French name I can't recall. You pick them, rub them with lard, and season them. A green branch is bent in a U and inserted in the cavity, and they're suspended over the coal, the best duck I ever ate. On day three, Kid and Earl in the lead canoe rounded a bend and shot a young moose of about 600 pounds. We spent four hours dressing and boning, caching the meat on an elevated platform. It froze every night. We were at the base of a small lake, and as we were working, Three canoes with the natives came down the lake at full speed. Kid waved them in. There were four adult males and two maybe teenagers and three adult women and one girl of about ten. I assumed they were extended family. We gave them about a hundred pounds of meat, some flour and tea and tobacco. They spoke no English, at least not in front of me, and I understood not a word except twice when one of the women said Sasquatch and laughed twice. At the time, I assumed she was making a joke for me. They left after smoking with us and giving us three big whitefish and some pemmican. We took maybe 20 pounds of prime meat, caching the rest under a tarp and some bark. The platform was standard cache for the area, about 12 feet off the ground. We went on still heading north and east. We left the small lake and went through a chute into another lake, and then east into a smaller river. The stream was maybe 40 to 60 feet wide and medium swift. About seven, we started looking for a campsite and found one on the north bank in a bend of the river. The right bank was covered with boulders, rounded by glycation and current but the left bank was clear with a flat area under some trees. We were all tired and hit the sack before full dark. It doesn't get dark there until tomorrow. Sometime, maybe two or three in the morning, Jim and I are awakened by a loud crash in the campsite. Thinking bare, we grabbed our guns and kicked back the tent flap. 
nothing. Jim had a flashlight, and he turned it on. Earl and Kid were now out of their tent and armed. A boulder about the size and shape of a bowling ball had destroyed our Dutch oven and part of the cook box. We stood around trying to sort things out when a second boulder hit Kid and Earl's tent dead center. It came straight down through the trees. I was standing there, open mouth, when both Kid and Jim grabbed me and Earl and drug us deeper into the trees. Naturally, there was a lot of discussion, but I won't relate the tenor of that. We spent the rest of the short night in a circle, back to back, safeties off. From time to time, we would hear more rocks hit, and one, just one, some sort of strange hooting from the other side of the river. After good sunup, we slowly crept back to camp. One tent was toast, as were the cook box and most of the cooking equipment. I counted nine rocks ranging in size from bowling ball to beach ball size. The largest weighed maybe 150 to 200 pounds. Fortunately, the canoes were undamaged and we quickly pulled up camp and started out. We got to the meat cache that morning and it was all gone. Not destroyed, gone. Totally 100% gone. No logs, no rope, no meat, no carcass. I have no opinion. We ran wide going out and camped that night in the canoes in the middle of a lake. Jim and Kid are now dead, killed in a float plane crash some years ago. Earl, I don't know about. I am certain of only five things regarding that trip. Those rocks were not on the bank where we pitched camp when we pitched camp. They were not carried into our camp. They were thrown. No human being did it. I have no desire ever again to go into that country. I am not a believer or a skeptic, but I don't exactly discount much if what of if what I don't understand. On to the next one. At Watson Bay in Roderick Island in British Columbia, Timothy Robinson and Samantha Duncan shot at a small Bigfoot on a beach. They found blood on the snow where the creature had been, but were afraid to follow it. On to the next one. At Ruby in Caribou County in the Fraser River in British Columbia, Mr. Paul Peters, an Athabascan First Nation, saw a hairy humanoid on the north side of the river near his fish camp when his dogs started whining and acting strangely. Paul then saw a humanoid 100 yards away that was very manlike, very tall, covered in black hair with a very stocky build and very muscular. The Bigfoot was six and a half feet tall. There had been hairy humanoid sightings here. On to the next one. This happened in Bell County in Kentucky. I was on Highway 72 about two miles from 119 when this thing came out in the road. It was big and black. A coal truck had to stop. Then it went over the hill and crossed the railroad tracks and it was gone. I've never seen something like it. It was big and black and it looked like a human. On to the next one. In Smith County in Mississippi, we were walking through a pasture to enter a woodline. The pasture has a creek running at the border of the woodline. When we got to within 10 to 15 yards from the creek, a large rock was thrown into the creek. The creek was three to four feet deep and the rock hit the creek bed. The land was private for six square miles. We followed the ripples in the water to see if an animal had jumped in but no activity from anything was found. 
on to the next one. In Tippa County in Mississippi, a large, hairy, bipedal creature crossed the road in front of my daughter and I while driving home. It took only two steps to completely cross the road. It then disappeared down the bank into some trees. It was seven and a half to eight feet tall and dark brown. I also heard strange howls and screams for several nights after that. On to the next one. In 2004, I was testing out the limit of my new three-foot lift on my new Jeep Rubicon, and I turned off Route 26 at the bottom of Grafton Notch just before the road darts up over the notch. I turned left onto a small tote road and headed back in as far as I could go. When I came to a stream, I stopped and hiked down the stream to see if I could find a beaver pond to catch some trout. Along my way, I came into a stand of cedar that had a mossy bottom. I came across a large set of footprints in the moth and followed them a short distance. Whomever made these tracks had bigger boots than me and a longer gait, but the thing that puzzled me was how remote this location was. There were no signs of another vehicle anywhere on the trail in for miles. Most vehicles could not get to where I was anyway because of the deep mud holes I went through. The Appalachian Trail does go relatively near the location within a mile. Anyway, I wish I was more alert to the Sasquatch mystery back then so I could have followed the tracks further watching for broken limbs and hair samples. On to the next one. In Stratford County in New Hampshire, my son and I were deer hunting near a large deer wintering yard not far from the Canadian border. It was snowing heavily as we were taking our evening stand. It became darker than normal due to the heavy snowfall, so I headed back toward the truck on the tote road that I walked in on. On the way, my son was also sitting on the side of the tote road and jumped to his feet quickly as I got to him and began a hurried pace back to the truck in front of me. We were walking in our old tracks that now had a couple of inches of snow in them. We got to the top of the ridge that we had to go down over. My son stopped dead in his tracks, staring at the trail. He was looking at some very large tracks that had been standing in our tracks. The tracks were about an inch larger in length and width than my size 12 wide, 800 gram, thin slate hunting boots. The tracks were as fresh as they could be in heavy snowfall, yet without seeing what made them. That being said, we could not make out threads or toes due to the snow falling back into the tracks when his foot was pulled out. What struck us as very strange was the direction he came from and returned. The nearest road in that direction is a mile away, over a heavily wooded ridge. He only had a few minutes of daylight left. Why he didn't follow our tracks back out to our truck and ask for a ride back around the mountain to his vehicle is odd, considering how hard it was snowing. Visibility was minimal even in the remaining twilight, when it got pitch dark, even with a light, he is going to have a hard time finding his way back. Also, when he stepped onto the tote road, he stepped down a four-foot-high embankment and into the road with one step. When he left, he stepped over the same embankment with one step. Not anything we could have done, and we are both over six feet tall. Also odd, was that he headed back on a tangent line to the line he walked in on. My son thinks it is possible that it was another hunter because they have been known to cross from other tote roads to this road during daylight. One more thing. Both my son and I experienced the feeling of dread and 
extreme uneasiness prior to heading out that evening. It was evident in my son's hurried pace. Neither of us have ever felt that way in the woods before. Several years before that, in the same area, I came across tracks in fresh snow of what appeared to be a hunter that had a gait that I could not match when I tried. I found it odd that a hunter would be running in the woods at dawn in the heart of a walk-in hunting area. His gait never slowed or stopped in over a half mile that I followed his tracks. The tracks were in fresh powder, but did not seem to be any bigger than my tracks. A hunting buddy of my son had a similar experience in the same tote road which borders a huge cedar swamp. Only this person or thing headed out into the swamp and never came back out. He followed it and saw where it stepped over blowdowns that he thought was not possible. I have one more incident that happened in the same time frame as the first report, but it occurred about 18 miles further north on the main New Hampshire border in October. I smelled a skunk-like smell when I came to some large footprints in the mud. This happened a mile or two from another sighting by a young couple in Bosebuck Mountain in Maine. On to the next one. My mother lives in Calhoun County in Mississippi. She told me her uncle lived in a rural area in the southern part of Calhoun County in the 1940s. Just an eighth of a mile down Moreland Road where he lived was a creek that ran into a very swampy area. He told her at night you could hear something hollering and some folks had seen a tall, hairy creature at the back side of a field by the swamp. My mother told me it was called Fuzzyfoot. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!